and not um, please use the Q&A function and not the chat function. Um, and I will read your question out loud and Professor Call uh, will respond. Um, I also would like to, uh, to welcome, we have uh, people attending this call from all over, I'd like to specifically um, acknowledge the presence from Africa of Ambassador Hailem and Karius, until recently uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations in charge of, of Africa. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Professor Nick Call, Nicholas J. Call, is Professor of Public Diplomacy and the founding director of the Master of Public Diplomacy program at USC's Annenberg School of Communications. He took his, both his BA and PhD at the University of Leeds, uh, but also studied as a graduate student at Princeton University uh, in the United States. He was a lecturer in American history at the University of Birmingham and a lecturer of American studies at the um, University of Leicester in England. His research and teaching interests are interdisciplinary in nature and focus on public diplomacy and more broadly, the role of media, culture, and propaganda in international um, history. He is the author of several books, most notably his two monumental volumes on the history of US public diplomacy. His first book, Selling War, was a study of British information work in the United States before Pearl Harbor. Today, Professor Call will be discussing the issue of his most recent book that deals with reputational security. In the spirit of one of his most recent articles titled Public Diplomacy for Losers, he will explain what that uh, reference uh, refers to. Um, so as I said, Professor Call will speak for 40 minutes and then we'll uh, devote the rest of the time for your questions. My dear friend, Professor Call, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ido. Now, if you just give me a moment uh, to share my screen. Um, just a second here. Okay, Ido, you have to disable your screen share and then I can go to I my did. slides. Just a moment here. And slideshow from the beginning and we're there. Okay, so you should now have my um, uh, my slide uh, my slides visible. Can you see them, Ido? Yes, yes. Is the screen share lovely? Okay, yes. well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. You know, this will be. Is this the fifth time I've done a a um, Charney um, New Ideas yeah. in Diplomacy seminar with you? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but first time we've done it by. Uh, uh, first time we've done it remotely. Um, well, what I want to talk about today is um, uh, ideas that come out of my recent book, Public Diplomacy Foundations for Global Engagement in the Digital Age, um, and which looked at the importance of, uh, the conclusion of that book was that the way forward for diplomacy is uh, cooperation. And I know this is something you've been writing about and thinking about and uh, uh, sort of the essence of the way the world uh, will or needs to work in the 21st century. Uh, but before I get into those issues and how they mesh with the experience we're having right now in um, uh, this uh, virus crisis, I, I want to talk about why leadership of this kind is hard at any time and uh, some of the reasons why countries got the approach of the virus so wrong. So I'll start off with that. Then I want to talk briefly about what I see the problems in the world being uh, on the eve of the crisis and the, if you like, what a military strategist would call the order of battle, the nature of the major players in this um, crisis uh, just before the viral outbreak uh, happened. I then want to identify three key virus diplomacy strategies, the three main uh, approaches that have been taken by uh, nation states and media organizations working with those nation states thus far. And then I'll get into that most dangerous of territories predictions as to how I think this is going to play out, the countries that I think will uh, gain an advantage from what's happening and the ones that will be seriously affected. 
as a historian, um, I'm always very concerned and very interested in precedents. And so I will uh, talk about some of the precedents I see in the global crisis of the 1930s, and um, which I think give us a can warn us um, of some of the things that, that are happening. And then my overall theme is that this is not a time for a nation state to attempt to go it alone. And uh, the very nature of this problem is that it needs a cooperative solution. The other thing that I'd say is that um, it's not just for the nation state to solve. Uh, one of the things that I take very strongly from this crisis is that the personal is very clearly political. And what we do, both as individuals uh, observing quarantine regulations and as digital citizens being careful about what we share online, this can make a big difference, not only to our own individual uh, success, but the success and uh, of our entire community. Um, so the first thing is why this is hard to do at any time. And the first thing I want to draw attention to is the problem of cognitive bias in leader perceptions. So uh, what I'm talking about here is the, the, the set of shortcuts that uh, everyone takes in their uh, thinking, uh, which are particularly dangerous if you are a leader. And I think that some of the misjudgments and missteps we've seen, especially in the West, are directly attributable to the operation of these biases. Now, the first bias is the optimism bias. That is the idea that this bad thing might never happen. So you don't prepare properly because you don't think it's going to happen. Hard on the heels of this, we have the first occurrence bias. If it hasn't happened before, it's never going to happen. So underestimating the likelihood of something bad happening if it hasn't happened before. And a good example of this would be the massive inundation of New Orleans uh, during Hurricane Katrina. It had never happened before, didn't mean it was just about to happen. Uh, the leadership at the state and federal level in the United States really misjudged that one. Uh, third one is a confirmation bias. And you see a lot of confirmation bias in reactions all around the world to the virus. Um, where people are reacting according to they're seeing what they want to see and uh, a lot of people saying i told you so even uh, taking the experience of the bias to the sorry the experience of the virus to confirm wildly different um wildly different uh, political uh, positions uh the fourth um uh, bias is I'm sorry to say racial prejudice where people would see something bad happening in another place in the world and say well if it happened to them because they are inferior to us uh, it'll be different in our case and the flip side of that is the positive prejudice around one's own country it won't happen to us because we are somehow superior um, I think that leaders feared that they would be accused of an overreaction if they acted uh, early and decisively. And uh, they also are very tuned in to rewards. And uh, everybody knows that if, uh, if you act early and prevent a crisis, um, that success might well be unrewarded. And a good example of this would be Y2K, where there, the uh, actions uh, were such that people afterwards doubted that there was any problem at all and saw it as maybe the boy crying wolf. Um, uh, so um, part of the art of leadership is picking exactly the right moment to respond to a crisis uh, so that it's best uh, politically. And I think we've seen some misjudgments around the best time to respond. Our moment in brief, that is the environment in which these uh, biases are playing out. The first thing to say is that there's only one superpower left, as I've said at a number of times uh, at these um, NYU uh, seminars, uh, quoting my colleague Simon Anholt, only one superpower left, but that superpower is global public opinion. The problem is that global publics are central to any process of governance in world affairs right now, but they are divided and may be increasingly divided and manipulated by uh, global and state medias. Uh, this is a moment of technological transition as well. I think this adds to the confusion uh, as we're moving away from the legacy media 
uh, the sort of top-down media uh, towards the social media and media being shared uh, horizontally on digital platforms. And I see this as inherently um, destabilizing. It's like, a, uh, if you think of media as a virus, it's as if we have the virus but haven't evolved the uh, skepticism that gives a public immunity or um, uh, antibodies to cope with that new way of uh, thinking and communicating. So the moment was already unstable. Uh, states were losing their credibility as communicators and were cutting budgets for communication, especially in the West. Uh, elsewhere in the world, people were ramping up communication, but it was inherently distorted communication, uh, communicating to gain an advantage. Publics all around the world have been looking for answers and have been turning to strong men and to ideas about the past, or maybe distorted ideas about the past, which give a kind of security. We see media being increasingly weaponized and uh, used to gain advantage. And this is the reason that I've started to move beyond just the concept of soft power, uh, reputation as a way of giving a state advantage, to actually think of the field of reputation as being a place where a state could actually be damaged. And we see attacks on reputation, we see attempts to uh, undermine reputation, and we see that a state without an adequate reputation can be diminished by uh, a hungry neighbor. Uh, I think this was Ukraine's whole problem um, in uh, uh, it, its dealings with Russia. It didn't have a reputation such that the world would rally indignantly to its uh, defense. So that's why I'm talking about reputational security. And I think that uh, response to the virus is going to be a major way in which reputation is judged going forward, certainly in the short term, but I believe in the long term too, that how a country responded to the virus will be part of its, um, the way it's evaluated by uh, other countries in the world uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in the near future. So then what about particular countries? Well, you know, the situation in the United States is that it is uh, uh, divided, uh, maybe more divided than at any time since the Vietnam War and possibly since the Civil War. Uh, it has a controversial and eccentric leader right now. Meanwhile, China is in the process of tightening control, eager to win the admiration of the world and super sensitive to public opinion. And I think this is probably part of the reason for the uh, missteps communicating around the virus at an early stage. Russia has uh, perhaps surprisingly some advantages, but only because it's playing a spoiling role, an entirely negative role uh, through its international media. It has zero stake in a status quo, and so why would it want to shore up that status quo? Instead, it's doing what it can to undermine the players that are dominant in the international system. The UN uh, is an important player, uh, especially through the World Health Organization, uh, but uh, in the United States is, is treated automatically with skepticism by um, uh, some, sec some political uh, sectors. And so a uh, weakness of the UN uh, is a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I'm quite frustrated by the American discourse around the UN. I'm sure the ambassador <laughs> is even more frustrated than me, but uh, maybe that'll come up in questions. The European Union, um, is not having its finest hour uh, previous to the virus, divided by multiple fault lines and uh, very much troubled by this question of migration. The UK was stuck in a, uh, a post-Brexit days. Um, uh, it it had, uh, was still in deep division, uh, controversy around its health service, uh, not, in, not its finest moment uh, before this happened. Japan also not doing terribly well, very prestige conscious, uh, not looking for anything that would, uh, or seeking to avoid anything that might disrupt the Olympics. Uh, the, the only country coming into this, I think, in a strong position was South Korea, which was enjoying an upswing in all kinds of indicators, uh, positive uh, reputation of its exports, uh, positive reputation of its culture, it had just won the Oscar, and 
um, was looking surprisingly uh, strong and people were beginning to pay attention to South Korea before this all happened. So um, the, the, that's a little bit of the background. Now we get into the strategies that are being used. First strategy that's being used is to talk about the self as a success. And immediately Japan has begun doing this. Uh, South Korea is doing it with more justification, I think. Um, the uh, US has been doing this uh, largely for uh, domestic consumption and not particularly credibly. So. Uh, this is where you uh, publicize the successes you're having uh, in your uh, domestic uh, combating of the virus. A lot of emphasis on heroic doctor and nurse stories, uh, talking about how resilient your public is, how wise decisions made by your government have been. Uh, one part of the context of this is that uh, we now have an overlap of domestic and foreign media. So, um, sometimes uh, the things you say to your own population about the virus become the things that people see about you around the world. And this could be a disadvantage for the United States. There's a term in television studies, which I expect you, you haven't run across, and that's competence porn. And that is the idea that people get pleasure, visual pleasure, from watching uh, very intelligent people solve problems in a 50 minute segment on TV. So uh, American shows like uh, ER or The West Wing in, in terms of politics um, show competent, young, beautiful people fixing the world uh, in a very cathartic way. The danger to the United States is that there is a, such an obvious gap between um, the chaos in, Ameri in real American uh, public health and the image on TV, and that that will be shocking to uh, audiences around the world. And that's a kind of a bump that other countries uh, don't have to face. We don't have ideas about super efficient uh, uh, South Korean doctors or super efficient um, uh, um, uh, politicians uh, in uh, other places. Uh, there's a danger of what's called the hostage to fortune, that is a nation state makes a claim which the uh, fates hear and then kind of uh, deliver a, a, a twist. Uh, and I think that uh, some of the early complacency of Japan uh, has um, already uh, played uh, to the negative. Uh, Japan had in fact to uh, cancel its Olympics having initially predicted that they had the whole thing under control and there'd be no problem. Um, it's interesting how stories can split. You can see that uh, it's possible to talk about good people and to, uh, for a nation state to find good stories in its public, even if its leadership is having problems. And this has uh, been a bit about the way in which uh, the UK has been talking about uh, the virus, emphasizing uh, citizenship and um, uh, good behavior of the public. Uh, you can also have positive stories coming from regions, even when there's a, a negative national story. The second strategy is the one that's a little bit more, more worrying, where you're talking about the rival or a geostrategic rival as a, a failure. It can be a reflex um, uh, to pay attention to positive policy missteps, to draw attention to um, uh, shortcomings, and maybe this is inevitably going to happen when a virus has a, a, ge a geographical point of origin. One of the things we see in is how uh, the uh, world conversation, including things leaders say, map onto existing problems and awareness of existing problems. So the US was a divided uh, country with race problems coming into uh, the situation, and the racial divisions are still very much in evidence. China was totalitarian, is totalitarian, its, re its response is totalitarian, and that's how people are going to talk about it. Italy had this reputation as a chaotic place. It has a chaotic response. Uh, that's part of how people are going to talk about it. In the UK, you can see how the media have given negative, uh, have given attention to particular pre-existing negative indicators. So in talking about the US, 
UK media has paid an inordinate amount of attention to the sale of guns because British people are obsessed with that is one of the major differences between uh, the US and the UK. Um, uh, so they, they paid a lot of attention to Americans feeling they needed guns uh, as the uh, crisis mounted. Um, one of the problems here is that given the differences in media structure around the world, it's possible for a commercial media point to be interpreted as a national media problem or a government media problem in another country. So an example here at the top of the page here, I have this cartoon uh, that appeared in a Danish newspaper showing the Chinese flag reimagined with viruses rather than stars. Now this was very offensive to a Chinese audiences, uh, the Chinese government complained, but to the Danish prime minister, who explained that there was freedom of speech in Denmark and she didn't want lectures from totalitarians. And so the problem escalated out of a, a free media statement into a government to government um, uh, problem. On top of this, there is deliberate disinformation where um, uh, nation states and state media are directing attentions to things that simply aren't true. Uh, whilst a number of countries are doing and sponsoring disinformation or passing on disinformation, uh, the place where uh, most is coming from, uh, based on analysis coming out of the European Union, is uh, Russia. And uh, there is danger, I think, to the reputation of Russia in using this strategy. Uh, right now, Russia is uh, promoting a lot of anti-vaccine stories internationally. But domestically, it's supporting ideas about vaccination. So um, I think that any time when you are telling, uh, splitting a story, one thing for foreigners, one thing at home, uh, you render yourself valuable, vulnerable. And uh, this is, I believe, too serious a problem to um, be used for uh, playing politics. Uh, the third strategy is one which is very ancient and it's been fascinating to see it come back to the fore in international relations, and that is the gift. Uh, we know from archaeological findings that even you know in ancient Egyptian times people sent gifts to neighboring rulers and there were elaborate rules about the giving and receiving of gifts. It's one of the most ancient building blocks of uh, relationships. It's even, I like to tell my students, it's even how human beings deal with the divinity is you offer him a sacrifice. So it's uh, uh, gift giving is, uh, I think, a, a reflex in human behavior. And uh, with the virus, we're seeing a lot of nation states seeking to win influence and secure relationships through gifts. But remember, gifts are always linked to obligations and to building up obligations to further advancing a relationship beyond the point of the gift. Maybe you're recognizing a relationship, maybe you're initiating or cementing or advancing a relationship. Some of the most successful gifts were the early gifts from South Korea and Japan sent to China in the first month of the virus. Uh, gifts of medical uh, technology, masks and so forth. Um, these were accompanied uh, with um, uh, cultural signifiers, lines of poetry, uh, allusions to uh, literature and, and so forth that showed an understanding of a shared East Asian culture. And this was very much appreciated and led to a tremendous feeling uh, among uh, people online in China, uh, positive feelings towards South Korea and uh, Japan. China has attempted to use uh, gifts uh, with its own relationships in, in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world, um, but their gifts have been criticized uh, as being of low quality or um, having too many strings attached. The most successful gifts have been the surprising ones. So Taiwan uh, gave some gifts to uh, Czech, the Czech Republic. This worked very well. Um, and the Albanians sending doctors to help Italy was deeply appreciated by, by the Italians. 
uh, and was attracted much more positive attention in Italy than the uh, response to uh, the Chinese doctors going to Italy. There are, of course, tremendous negatives in criticizing other people's gifts, which can cause a lot of offense, and in refusing gifts. And I think that uh, the attitude of President Trump towards masks from other places, towards uh, testing kits and so forth, uh, is one of the things that uh, uh, goes on the negative side of his ledger. The most interesting gift story has been this complex game that's been played by President Vucic in Serbia, uh, where he has been making a fuss of a small gift and then kind of suggesting that somebody else might like to give a better one. So he played the Russian gift against the Chinese gift uh, and neglected to thank the European Union, but then that encouraged the European Union to do something even better for Serbia. So playing your, but this is a familiar game in Serbian politics. It's basically what he's been doing for the last five years, uh, um, uh, you know, enjoying uh, uh, the uh, suitors for their hand in marriage of Serbia. Um, the most successful, from my point of view, the one that we need to work with is the partnership strategy. Now, partnerships are still emerging as a source of reputation, but I believe that we need partnerships uh, to succeed in a world in which problems don't have passports, the great phrase from Kofi Annan. Uh, if we really are in one world, then how we contribute to that one world, uh, working towards the good of that one world, will be how we're judged, how our relevance will be uh, assessed and a country that looks after itself exclusively will not be that admirable to others. This is not the 19th century. Um, relevance to one another, I think, is going to be the essential uh, yardstick of the 21st century. Of countries that are doing this very well, uh, I'm impressed with uh, Canada right now. Um, not only domestically, where they have this interesting idea they call caremongering of people uh, trying to create a kind of a a, um, a cumulative snowballing, um, uh, good messages, positive reinforcement for the community online, but uh, uh, supporting indeed increasing support for uh, international organizations at this moment. Uh, there are great positives in affirming partnerships. Uh, Finland has increased uh, aid to the World Health Organization. Today, China has increased its aid to the World Health Organization. Flip side is there are great negatives in attacking partnerships. And I think that President Trump's decision to cut friend, uh, funds to the World Health Organization was a massive misstep. I also see uh, big negatives in being too unilateral. Uh, there was a tremendous shock in German public opinion when uh, President Trump tried to acquire a monopoly on that German uh, vaccine. Um, that was a real misjudgment of, uh, they say, you know, misreading the room. That was a real misjudgment of what was, uh, what people were thinking and feeling at that particular moment. A uh, final point to make around uh, this sort of trip through the uh, messaging we're seeing is that the virus is serving a lot of what I would call collateral agendas. Um, people are going into this crisis with confirmation bias and they're seeing the relevance of the virus to their own particular story. Uh, they're looking for their own agenda or looking to uh, maybe consciously or unconsciously uh, connect the um, uh, the crisis to uh, the things that they already care about. That means we see in the media uh, emphasis on these environmental rebound stories. That you know, you saw the meme about dolphins have returned to uh, the canals of Venice. Um, you see the technological miracle stories that people who love technology are reporting, oh, an amazing technological breakthrough that's going to uh, solve everything. You're seeing vaccination conspiracy stories and other conspiracy stories. Uh, I think that the people, if, if, if uh, there is any international regard for the British people, it was not helped by stories about British people burning down cell phone towers because they believed that the virus was being um, uh, radio controlled <laughs> uh, 
utterly ridiculous. We're also seeing the emergence or re-emergence of familiar tropes, anti-Semitic tropes, blaming Jewish people for the virus, uh, white supremacists, uh, seeing this as a moment for uh, the uh, white uh, race to emerge and reassert uh, world leadership. Uh, but um, there are corporate reputations are being made, but remember how quickly these can turn. I thought it was so interesting how for the first month of the crisis, Zoom was the uh, savior. Uh, and yet uh, suddenly things went wrong for Zoom with stories around Zoom bombing. And uh, I think they will come out of this with a mixed uh, corporate record, not necessarily the undiluted uh, success story of the crisis. I see great importance in the individual choices that citizens make in making sure or uh, helping our citizens strengthening the choices that citizens make so they don't just uh, say the right thing but they actually do the right thing and I think that uh, citizen behavior will be one of the uh, criteria that countries are judged by and this means not just physical behavior but online behavior so uh, i think a wise government would encourage people at this point to think before sharing uh information online uh and um the most interesting term i've seen added to our vocabulary is uh, from a scholar called nina yankovitz um, who has argued that we, uh, we understand the need for social distancing, but she's arguing for informational distancing too. Keep that piece of information about the virus at arm's length, be careful how you use it, be careful who you pass it on to. Uh, and uh, I think informational distancing, I was very ha glad to run across that in, uh, in an essay. So my predictions, maybe the bit you've been waiting for. The big beneficiaries are going to be the countries that have ongoing positive stories. South Korea, New Zealand, Finland were all being well written about around the world and they will continue to be written about. They were getting written about for good reason because they were coping with problems in innovative ways. Think about the way in which Jacinda Ahern in uh, New Zealand coped with the um, uh, their mass shooting last year, we were already impressed and people are remaining impressed with those three places particularly. I'm especially interested in the response of and to uh, Taiwan, which doesn't have any mechanisms in international affairs to speak of beyond uh, its soft power and doesn't have a strategy beyond trying uh, quickly to secure reputational security. They're doing a lot to publicize their um, uh, successes so far dealing with the virus, including emailing academics and providing updates on uh, talking points on Taiwanese success. <coughs> for Iceland and for Greece, two places that had had problems in recent years, successful uh, response to the virus is giving them an opportunity for redemption. Iceland has been able to move into a kind of a regional reputational story, the story of Nordic competence. So um, Iceland is now included in the same set as Finland as being a country that knows what it's doing when it comes to the virus. The big casualty is the United States. The United States came into the crisis with uh, inequality, political division, and poor health care. There are many wonderful things about the United States, but I don't know anyone who would say that American health care is one of the great, um, uh, or the delivery of American health care is one of the country's great success stories. Everybody knows that there are problems in health care. And uh, I think a pandemic is the moment where you realize that your health depends on the health of your neighbor. And that has not been the philosophy at the heart of American healthcare. It's always been, I want the best for me. You want to be the, you want the best too. Well, uh, you become a success and then see what happens. Um, the damage, uh, there will be reputational damage to the United States of being the biggest casualty in ex absolute numbers. Even though bizarrely, if you look at deaths so far as a 
proportion of the population, New Zealand is doing worse than the United States. Uh, that's not how anybody is going to uh, look at this. I think we could easily see by the end of this more people uh, dead as a result of the virus than uh, Americans killed in the Vietnam War. Uh, we're only 10,000 short of that number as of today. Uh, I think there are also problems around public behavior and the stories of Americans um, disputing quarantine restrictions that everybody else is fine with, uh, the stories of American uh, disobedience uh, will not play well for the United States and the stories of cohesion will be and are being um, uh, contributing positively to the nation states that are able to behave in a cohesive way. Um, to be honest, um, I think that um, the big problem will come if President Trump is, who does not play well with international audiences, if what you care about is the reputation of the United States, it hasn't been uh, it hasn't, it has been affected by the Trump administration, but the effect has been a drop from number one in the uh, Anholt index down to about number six or seven. I think that that will become much worse, much more severe damage if President Trump is re-elected in November, because that will mean that the problem is not with a single eccentric leader, but with a um, the nation state or large sections of the nation state as a whole, the American people become the problem for choosing somebody like that twice who is so at odds with this necessary global trend, uh, as I see it, of uh, cooperation. I think we have uh, places and people that are achieving a new salience. There's an opportunity for exceptions, the good places, the cities and regions, uh, like um, uh, California with Gavin Newsom, uh, the work of Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, these people will emerge as nationally significant uh, voices. I'm interested in uh, other places in uh, Yuriko Koiki, the uh, governor of Tokyo, who in contrast to Shinzo Abe has done an amazing job of engaging with the people and uh, is also doing daily press conferences in English. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that she's going to be a major player in Japanese politics after all this. Good places, good leaders. I think there's also a perception of a good gender. I've been really interested in the competent woman leaders memes that have been going around and uh, people noticing that the most effective leaders, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Jacinda Ahern, and so forth are, are female. And um, it may be that female leadership is more compatible with the kind of um, cooperation that is necessary to get over this uh, problem. We see uh, importance of scientific sources, credible experts like Dr. Fauci, uh, question mark over good platforms. Facebook would like to be a good platform. Uh, YouTube would like to be a good platform and they're starting to rein in use of the platforms for disinformation. We're seeing the emergence of good sectors, uh, soft power uh, coming out of medicines. And of course, the great reputational bounce in all this will come from the country or people associated with uh, a cure for the coronavirus. And I think many countries in the world are well aware of this and are trying to get their biotech sectors. Fingers crossed that their biotech sector will be the one that lands the cure or the vaccine. I'm concerned by the precedent that we have from the 1930s. And let me talk through that. You know, I'm a historian. Of course, I'm going to find a uh, talk about something in the past. When we look at the data around international reputation, it's a common observation that reputations change very, very slowly. Uh, people really like the stereotype they have of country A, country B, and uh, are, are incredibly reluctant to reposition how they feel about a country. But a major crisis, especially a sustained crisis, as the crisis we seem to be heading into, or the crisis the world experienced in the 1930s, these crises do shift relevance and a dramatic experience in this kind of crisis can make or break a reputation. An example of a local politician who rose during this kind of crisis, 
Franklin Roosevelt. He started out as the governor of New York, did a good job like um, Governor Cuomo, and uh, was a um, uh, unprecedented success as president of the United States. The crisis of the 1930s made a new player on the international scene relevant. Finland repaid its uh, war debt to the United States and uh, achieved a tremendous reputational boost from that. Flip side is the crisis revealed an old but respected player as unexpectedly weak. Um, and the reputation of France, uh, some people would say, has never quite recovered from the experience of the crisis in the 1930s. We also see how uh, a crisis can be distorted by new media. I think the crisis of the 30s was made worse by the rise of radio, which people still didn't know how to filter out or um, uh, process. Uh, and uh, a crisis gives scope for old prejudices. I don't need to tell you how old prejudices came back as convenient explanations for world problems in the 1930s. Here we see a division. Do you answer a crisis unilaterally or multilaterally? In the 30s, the world tried to answer its problems unilaterally in the first instance. Players without reputation suffered first. Here I'm thinking about Czechoslovakia, but everybody suffered in the longer term. And the big failure was a failure to see our interdependence. So this is why I'm hoping we can recognize our interdependence and get straight to the rebuilding process without the, unilater the failed unilateral strategies uh, uh, time. I see particular implications in all this for Israel right now, uh, but uh, you can see how the stories coming out of Israel depend on who you're, uh, the sources you're reading. Jerusalem Post has been doing a lot of stuff, optimistic stories about biotech and the possibility of an Israeli firm finding a, a cure. Uh, Haaretz has been uh, emphasizing uh, problems, talking about uh, particular problems getting tests if you're an Israeli of Arab origin or the, that police raid last week on the Silwan Clinic in East Jerusalem. So. Uh, I think that both of these, if you like, are, uh, you could say it's editorial confirmation bias. Uh, there have been interesting bilateral stories. I thought that the thanks to India, um, that whole India-Israel story where India exported drugs, very interesting. Uh, and I was very impressed by the um, demonstration last week in uh, Jerusalem. I think that that was a, a moment when something happening in Israel was actually inspirational to the world and is a moment that should be, uh, did good to the reputation of Israel. But my underlying feeling here is that Israel particularly has a lot to play for and has an opportunity to be of value to the world, uh, but it's important to be a team player and to work as far as possible with uh, joint um, uh, solutions and joint efforts. My conclusion is that to me this is like a, watching a running race uh, going into a tunnel, that we see the runners going in, we don't know quite the order they're going to be when they're coming out. We can see that the usual uh, political devices like frames, uh, the actual outcomes around the virus, how publics behave, what governments say and do, uh, how regions cope, these are all going to uh, determine uh, the reputational outcome. Uh, I think that the World Health Summit in May is going to be key. It's going to be a moment when South Korea will address the world on its solutions. Remember though, the reaction and attitude of ordinary citizens is important here. It's not just about governments, citizens themselves make a difference. From my point of view, I'm waiting to see the exact numbers as they come out from Pew, as they come out from uh, the 2020 Simon Anholt survey. And that's how we will really know which countries have advanced their reputation as a result of this. But I think it's an incredibly significant moment, an epoch defining moment in world affairs. And thank you for allowing me to speculate about it with you today. Thank you, Ido. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Call. And um, um, I would like to um, to ask the people that uh, sent um, the questions to 
resend them because they somehow disappeared from the I've got them I've got them oh, in you, my Q&A all right uh, if you've so got the them in your Q&A so before before you go to the first question I'd like to to present the question to you yes. uh, which refers to the um, to the issue of the of global public opinion being the only superpower left um, if you consider that one of the biggest um, innovations really of the information revolution is the fact that we're now able to self-design our own informational feed, meaning we are working vis-a-vis -vis an algorithm rather than a, a, a living editor. Uh, what are the challenges with this newly self-designed feed that governments and corporations have to deal with in this reality where global opinion is the only superpower left? Well, I think that that adds a whole level of complication to what's going on, and it's part of the reason that we're seeing a um, uh, a media that we don't quite know how to cope with. So I think, uh, you, uh, can you still hear me? You've suddenly stopped moving. Have you? Can you hear me? Ido, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think I, I just had um, a little glitch there. Well, I think yeah. that, that what you're raising is yeah. one of the key problems that we actually uh, are still learning how to cope with these algorithms. And um, I, I don't think people have the answer to that yet. Um, but it's I believe that that's adding to the chaos uh, because some incredibly un- um, what would you call it, unreliable information or speculative information is being shared. I think this is a moment to fall back on legacy communicators. And so <laughs> I mean, I'm so stereotypically British, but I don't believe it unless it's on the BBC or unless I see a story about it in The Guardian. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm tired of um, uh, some of the internet platforms um, uh, carrying incredibly unreliable stuff and uh, seeing um, uh, things being shared that people would like to be true, uh, but which aren't. And that's why I think this informational distancing is such a, uh, uh, a helpful idea. Yeah, so we have, have um, just to flow on that, um, a question. Uh, oh, you're frozen again. Is that you or me? It would help um... uh, going to come out of this place. And secondly, about the missteps taken by the Chinese government early on, not being transparent enough and raising the level of anxiety all over the world. Could you say that again? I had a glitch. So uh, the first question is about Latin America and specifically about Brazil and the, the way Brazil is handling the whole thing. And the second thing is um, how this a crisis uh, could have evolved if China would have been more transparent early on. Right. Um, I, I, I'm. I'm not sure that I'm alive. That I think I'm. Uh, it's not clear to me that, I'm, uh, that, the, that the connection's working. It would help if you. It might sound odd, but it would help if you could keep moving. That I know that my connection's still good. That's great. Thanks, Ian. Oh, well. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, well, I, I think that um, the behavior of China is going to be uh, a question that will be um, uh, of great concern and uh, to ch the reputation of China going forward. Um, I think that um, the Chinese government itself is concerned about this. Uh, one of the things that's shown up is the pre-existing division between what happens in a Chinese city and what the preferences are of the um, uh, of the central government in Beijing. And you know, it's an old old Chinese government tradition that the local government lies to the provincial government, who lies to the national government, and we're seeing the problem of that. And uh, I think the um, uh, this business of uh, underplaying the virus, 
uh, you know, turns out to have been a big mistake, uh, but it's a big mistake that they're very much, um, they're very much aware of. And uh, the decision last week to increase the uh, level of uh, death in um, Wuhan, the, the, the number, uh, double the number of deaths in Wuhan was a, a, an attempt to retroactively patch, uh, patch this up. Um, but you know they say in Shakespeare, me think the me thinks the lady doth protest too much, uh, and I think that there is a message in the extent to which the Chinese government is now really, really trying to be on top of this and sharing with people, and uh, they they know that their reputation is is on the line. Uh, with regard to Brazil, uh, I think that Bolsonaro is also one of the people whose um, behaviour is. Um, uh, exciting international criticism um, and uh, it doesn't seem to be doing much good for the reputation of uh, Brazil uh, but uh, the um, there is a whole information struggle going on between uh, China and uh, the West uh, happening in Spanish and Portuguese media in Latin America so that's one of the theatres of uh, reputational struggle right now and it'll be interesting to see who's able to win out uh, because you know there's, there's disinformation circulating there are all kinds of claims being made and um, uh, the English language isn't the only language in which these international struggles are happening in also a lot happening in Arabic right now around uh, stories around the origins of the virus yeah one of the interesting things is that we were here in Israel we were anticipating uh, dramatic and significant outbreak of the pandemic in refugee camps, but it's not happening. And experts are telling us that it's because those places have not been frequented by tourists. Um, uh, so so yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, Charles from Denver is asking about Africa, specifically about South Africa and Nigeria as the two largest uh, countries on the continent. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it. Uh, um, I've been following South Africa because I write a bit about South Africa, uh, and it's been interesting to see a, a decisive response by South Africa. Sorry, I'm still here. The story I was most interested in relating to Nigeria was the, the story around uh, racism towards Nigerians in China, uh, which was an, a, an under the radar story for many years, but flared up with the new relevance around the virus. And I think that that is going to be very damaging. Uh, publicity around that is very damaging for the attempt of China to win friends in uh, Africa, which is one of the ongoing um, geostrategic, uh, big ongoing geostrategic stories. Now, Joyce uh, from Cornell was asking about uh, multinational corporations and how should they be dealing with the their reputation for, you know, post COVID-19? Well, they have to be really careful. Um, and I think that uh, the within the context of the united states there's a problem of the corporations or bigger companies accepting what's called you know corporate welfare uh, i think that um uh, we are seeing uh, everybody in public life uh under tremendous scrutiny uh but uh, you know there's a problem for captains of industry right now and i'm sure there are consultants going around telling them how to behave what to say what not to say and we're seeing some missteps i think uh uh, it was not a good idea for Richard Branson to ask the government of the UK for a for a loan uh, when his whole reputation is based on being smart and rich to then say, well, but I'm not that rich. I, you know, um, uh, this um, the point about uh, corporations um, privatizing profits, but uh, 
making risks public and expecting corporate welfare, I, th I, I, I think they have to be really careful right now uh, because they're dealing, they're not, this is not 2008. This is a world that has had two election cycles uh, hearing from Bernie Sanders. Uh, and um, I think that uh, they should pay a lot of attention to being for their people, taking good care of their people. And um, uh, we, I would anticipate a renewed emphasis on corporate social responsibility. Yeah. I think it looks bad for Bezos, you know, um, and missteps, you know, putting up little Valentine type ads about how wonderful your workers are, but then not providing them with PPE. Um, that will prov provoke a, a reaction and is already provoking ridicule. Uh, the world, you know, likes rich people when there's a um, uh, no problem, but when they're looking after their riches and uh, rather than the people who have contributed to that, that's a um, problem. Um, Alexandra from, from New York is asking in the context of the gift strategy, if there is a, a place to consider the work of charitable foundations like the Gates Foundation and so on yeah. as a player. Yeah, no, that's right, absolutely. And I think it's very interesting how the Gates Foundation has come into this as a um, a negative, right? Uh, in in terms of disinformation. So if if you track disinformation, uh, you'll know that there always has to be a villain. And uh, for the last couple of years, uh, disinformation and conspiracy theorists had pointed to George Soros as being like uh, the evil mastermind uh, behind the uh, problems of the world. Now that's now shifted to the Gates Foundation and to Bill Gates uh, with some crazy allegations around why he wants everybody to be vaccinated. Um, the fact that disinformation and conspiracy is telling a negative story, I think is an indication of the significance of these foundations and the fact that they're actually a really important part of the positive story. In fact, the, the, you can't have the, um, the sort of partnerships to solve problems without somebody in the partnership having experience and somebody having resource. The role of the nation state is sometimes to generate the uh, vision and to provide the coordinating power. But you need the foundations to deliver the, the money uh, and you need local NGOs to bring the enthusiasm and the connections on the street. So I, I think it's really very, very interesting um, to, to see the demonization of uh, the NGOs and the big foundations. And I've been expecting it for a long time. Yeah, um, David Milch from New York is, is, um, is noting that uh, COVID-19 is not going to go away. And um, the first two decades of the, of the 20th century were marked by the Spanish flu. And so given this abnormality, the question, the question that he's asking is, what is the longer term process for realignment, right? In the face of this new abnormal coming out of COVID-19? And uh, is, is there a truly sustainable new normal? Well, I'm sure there. I'm sure there. There is, and human beings are amazingly resilient. But we're not going to find that new normal by ourselves. And um, I've. Oh, I. I believe international affairs is like a pendulum, that you swing from unilateral solutions to multilateral solutions, and quite often the unilateral solutions are, all, are what bring the, the conflicts. So it was the unilateralism of 1914 that produced the First World War. Uh, we fix that with multilateralism in 1919. Uh, the unilateralism of the 30s brought the Second World War. We fix that with unilateralism in the 40s and 50s, uh, or it certainly had great advances through that uh, multilateralism. Uh, and I, 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 that's the only place we have to go to, is working together, listening to each other. Um, and uh, I think that there will be some nation states with positive reputations coming out of this who have legitimacy and who we will want to listen to. I think that somebody uh, like President Moon from South Korea, somebody like Jacinda Ahern from um, New Zealand will have tremendous uh, appeal and uh, legitimacy talking to a, um, uh, a global audience. 
and I, I'm very interested to see what happens. Um, our time is up, but we have three more questions. So let me just shoot those questions at you and then if you can answer them all together and then we'll end the session with your permission. Sure. Is uh, Bruce uh, from New York is asking specifically about the role of Bloomberg Philanthropies and Bloomberg Associates bringing people together, introducing a new collaborative form of international relations. Peter Denon is asking about um, the State Department self-congratulatory -congratu uh, statement. They're continuing to lead the world's humanitarian efforts. Uh, he's asking, how does this sort of unilateral action affect the U.S. Uh, reputation? And uh, Eric from, from Israel is asking, how value national priority promoted why all countries fight over the same resources? and need to take care of themselves first. Right, um, so uh, in terms of Bloomberg, that's something I need to uh, look into be before I comment, because I'm just not familiar with that work. In terms of the State Department, uh, I think it's been interesting to see them publicizing their unilateral uh, or bilateral aid programs, because I think if more Americans knew about that, they'd want to stop it. Uh, so uh, they should be careful what they talk about, um, uh, uh, the, given, given the mood right now. Um, but uh, what I would say is that a good, mem a good model for partnership was PEPFAR, uh, the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, which was started by George W. Bush and uh, has uh, led to a, a kind of a, within Africa, a positive feeling towards the United States that is, uh, it's more popular East Asia or uh, uh, the Middle East. There's a kind of little island of positivity towards the United States in Africa as a result of that. So I think PEPFAR is a good model going forward. For Eric's question, um, uh, shouldn't countries look after themselves? Uh, yes, but you need a you need a, a, a dual um, uh, focus uh, because ultimately looking after yourself is also looking after your neighbor, especially when you're thinking about um, coping with a disease and looking after your neighbor is also looking after yourself. So under this, um, uh, we've had too much emphasis on independence. We need to think about interdependence. And if you want people to care about the preservation of your state, you have to be relevant to them and uh, cooperation being part of a good team is, is the way to do it. I think that the methods of the past, just asserting sovereignty, are, um, are not the best way of doing it right now. And I know that there are places in the world where that's difficult, um, but uh, anything that can be done to add strong team engagement to uh, your international profile will be positive. But and thank you for your questions. Great questions, Ido. Great presentation. I would like to thank you on behalf of all the people that were uh, joining us for this session from all over the world. You've been terrific as always. We can't wait for your next appearance at the uh, Rennet Forum at NYU. And uh, thank you so much. Um, oh, yeah, thank you for having me. And please, everybody, stay safe and follow the rules, you know. Yeah, take They're care. They're there for a Bye -bye. reason. See you. Bye-bye.